that done if it belong to a small whale it is hoisted on deck to be deliberately disposed of but with a full-grown levia then this is impossible for the sperm whale's head embraces nearly one-third of his entire bulk and completely to suspend such a burden as that even the peckwood's whale being decapitated and the body stripped the head was hoisted against the ship's side about halfway out of the sea so that it might yet in great part be buoyed up by it and there with the strained craft steeply leaning over to it by reason of the enormous downward drag from the lower mast head and every yard arm on that side projecting like a crane over the waves when this last task was accomplished it was noon and the seamen went below to their dinner silence reigned over the before tumultuous but now deserted deck an intense copper calm like a universal yellow lotus was more and more unfolding its noiseless measureless leaves upon the sea a short space elapsed and up into this noiselessness came ahab alone from his cabin taking a few turns on the quarter deck he paused to gaze over the side then slowly getting into the main chains he took stubb's long spade still remaining there after the whale's decapitation it was a black and hooded head and hanging there in the midst of so intense a calm it seemed the sphinx in the desert speak thou vast and venerable head muttered a hab which though ungarnished with a beard yet here and there lookest hoary with mosses speak mighty head of all the vers, thou hast dived the deepest that head upon which the upper sun now gleams has moved amid this world's foundations where unrecorded names and navies rust and untold hopes and anchors rot where in her murderous hold this frigate earth is ballasted with bones of millions of the drowned thou hast been where bell or diver never went hast slept by many a sailor's side where sleepless mothers would give their lives to lay them down thou sawst the locked lovers when leaping from their flaming ship heart to heart they sank beneath the exulting wave true to each other when heaven seemed false to them thou sawst the murdered mate when tossed by pirates from the midnight deck for hours he fell into the deeper midnight of the insatiate maw and his murderers still sailed on unharmed o head thou hast seen enough to split the planets and make an infidel of abraham and not one syllable is thine sail ha cried a triumphant voice from the mainmast head a well now that's cheering cried a hab suddenly erecting himself while whole thunderclouds swept aside from his brow that lively cry upon this deadly calm might almost convert a better man where away three points on the starboard bow sir and bringing down her breeze to us would now saint paul would come along that way and to my breezelessness bring his breeze o nature and o soul of man how far beyond all utterance are your linked analogies the jeroboam's story hand in hand ship and breeze blew on but the breeze came faster than the ship and soon the peckwood began to rock by and by through the glass the stranger's boats and manned mastheads proved her a whale ship but as she was so far to windward and shooting by apparently making a passage to some other ground the peckwood could not hope to reach her so the signal was set to see what response would be made here be it said that like the vessels of military marines the ships of the american whale fleet have each a private signal all which signals being collected in a book with the names of the respective vessels thereby the whale commanders are enabled to recognize each other upon the ocean even at considerable distances and with no small facility the peckwood's signal was at last responded to by the stranger's setting her own which proved the ship to be the jeroboam of nantucket squaring her yards she bore down ranged a beam under the peckwood's lee and lowered a boat soon drew nigh but as the sun it turned out that the jeroboam had a malignant epidemic on board and that mayhew her captain was fearful of infecting the peckwood's company for though himself and boat's crew remained untainted and though his ship was half a rifle shot off and an incorruptible sea and air rolling and flowing between yet 
but this did by no means prevent all communications. Preserving an interval of some few yards between itself and the ship, the Jeroboam's boat, by the occasional use of its oars, contrived to keep parallel to the Pickwood, as she heavily forged. Subject to this, and other the like interruptions now and then, a conversation was sustained between the two parties, but at intervals not without still another interruption of a very different sort. Pulling an oar in the Jeroboam's boat was a man of a singular appearance, even in that wild wailing life where individual notabilities make up all totalities. He was a small, short, youngish man, sprinkled all over his face with freckles, and wearing redundant yellow hair. A long-skirted, cabalistically cut coat of a faded walnut tinge enveloped him, the overlapping sleeves of which were rolled up on his wrists. A deep, settled, fanatic delirium was in his eyes. So soon as this figure had been first descried, Stubb had exclaimed, That's he, that's he, the long-togged scaramouch the townhouse company told us of Stubb here alluded to a strange story told of the jury. According to this account and what was subsequently learned, it seemed that the scaramouch in question had gained a wonderful ascendancy over almost everybody in the Jeroboam. His story was this. He had been originally nurtured among the crazy society of Nescuna Shakers, where he had been a great prophet. In their cracked, secret meetings, a strange, apostolic whim having seized him, he had left Nescuna for Nantucket, where, with that cunning peculiar to craziness, he assumed a steady common They engaged him, but straightway upon the ship's getting out of sight of land, his insanity broke out in a freshet. He announced himself as the Archangel Gabriel and commanded the captain to jump overboard. He published his manifesto, whereby he set himself forth as the deliverer of the Isles of the Sea and Vicar General of all Osanica. The unflinching earnestness with which he declared these things the dark, daring play of his sleepless, excited imagination, and all the preternatural terrors of real delirium. Moreover, they were afraid of him. As such a man, however, was not of much practical use in the ship, especially as he refused to work except when he pleased. The incredulous captain would fain have been rid of him. So strongly did he work upon his disciples among the crew, that at last in a body they went to the captain and told him if Gabriel was sent from the ship, not a man of them would remain. He was therefore forced to relinquish his plan. Nor would they permit Gabriel to be any way maltreated, say or do what he would. So that it came to pass that Gabriel had the complete freedom of the ship. The consequence of all this was that the archangel cared little or nothing for the captain and mates. And since the epidemic had broken out, he carried a higher hand than ever, declaring that the sailors, mostly poor devils, cringed, and some of them fawned before him, in obedience to his instructions, sometimes rendering him personal homage. Such things may seem incredible, but however wondrous, they are true. Nor is the history of fanatics half so striking in respect to the measureless self-deception of the fanatic himself as his measureless power of deceiving and bedevilling so many others. But it is time to return to the Pickwood. I fear not thy epidemic. Man, said Ahab from the bulwarks to Captain Mayhew, who stood in the boat's stern, come on board. But now Gabriel started to his Think, think of the fevers, yellow and bilious. Beware of the horrible plague, Gabriel. Gabriel, cried Captain Mayhew. Thou must either, but that instant hast thou seen the white whale, demanded a hab, when the boat drifted back. Think, think of thy whale-boat, stoven and sunk. Beware of the horrible tale, I tell thee again, Gabriel, that, but again the boat tore ahead as if dragged by feet. Nothing was said for some moments, while a succession of riotous waves rolled by, which by one of those occasional caprices of the seas were tumbling, not heaving it. Meantime, the hoisted sperm whale's head jogged about very violently, and Gabriel was seen eyeing it with rather more apprehensiveness than his archangel nature seemed to warrant. When this interlude was over, Captain May began a dark story concerning Moby Dick. Not, however, 
without frequent interruptions from Gabriel, whenever his name was mentioned. It seemed that the Jeroboam had not long left home, when upon speaking a whale ship, her people were reliably apprised of the existence of Moby Dick, and the havoc he had made. Greedily sucking in this intelligence, Gabriel solemnly warned the captain against attacking the white whale, in case the monster should be seen. In his gibbering insanity, pronounced, but when, some year or two afterwards, Moby Dick was fairly sighted from the mastheads, Macy, the chief mate, burned with ardor to encounter him, and the, with them he pushed off, and, after much wary pulling and many perilous, unsuccessful onsets, he at last succeeded in getting one iron fast. Meantime, Gabriel, ascending to the main royal masthead, was tossing one arm in frantic gestures, and hurling forth prophecies of speedy doom to the sacrilegious. Now, while Macy the mate was standing up in his boat's bow, and with all the reckless energy of his tribe was venting his wild exclamations upon the whale, and essaying to get a fair next instant, the luckless mate, so full of furious life, was smitten bodily into the air, and making a long arc in his descent, fell into the sea at the dip. Not a chip of the boat was harmed, nor a hair of any oarsman's head, but the mate forever sank. It is well to parenthesize here that of the fatal accidents in the sperm whale fishery. This kind is perhaps almost as frequent as any. Sometimes nothing is injured but the man who is thus annihilated. Oftener the boat's bow is knocked off, or the thigh board, in which the headsman stands, is torn from its place and accompanies but strangest of all is the circumstance that in more instances than one, when the body has been recovered, not a single mark of violence is discernible, the man being stark dead. The whole calamity, with the falling form of Macy, was plainly descried from the ship, raising a piercing shriek, the vile, the vile. Gabriel called off the terror-stricken crew from the further hunting of the whale. This terrible event clothed the archangel with added influence, because his credulous disciples believed that he had specifically foreannounced it, instead of only making a general prophecy. He became a nameless terror to the ship, May having concluded his narration. Ahab put such questions to him that the stranger captain could not forbear inquiring whether he intended to hunt the white whale if opportunity should offer. To which Ahab answered a straight way, then, Gabriel once more started to his feet, glaring upon the old man, and vehemently exclaimed, with downward pointed, Starbuck, look over the bag. Every whale ship takes out a goodly number of letters for various ships, whose delivery to the persons to whom they may be addressed, depends upon the mere ch Thus, most letters never reach their mark, and many are only received after attaining an age of two or three years or more. Soon Starbuck returned with a letter in his hand. It was sorely tumbled, damp, and covered with a dull spotted, green mud, in consequence of being kept in a dark locker of the cabin. Of such a letter, Death himself might well have been the postboy. Canst not read it, cried Ahab. Give it me, man. Ay, ay, it's but a dim scrawl. What's this? As he was studying it out, Starbuck took a long cutting spade pole, and with his knife slightly split the end to in meantime, Ahab holding the letter, muttered Mr. Har yes, Mr. Harry Woman's pinny hand, the man's wife, I'll wager A Mr. Harry Macy ship Jeroboam, why it's Macy, and he's dead, poor fellow, poor fellow, and from his wife, sighed Mayhew, but let me have it. Nay, keep it thyself. Captain Mayhew, stand by now to receive it. And taking the fatal missive from Starbuck's hands, he caught it in the slit of the pole, and reached it over towards the boat. But as he did so, the oarsman expectantly desisted from rowing. The boat drifted a little towards the ship's stern, so that as if by magic, the letter suddenly ranged along. He clutched it in an instant, seized the boat knife, and impaling the letter on it, sent it thus loaded back into the ship. It fell at Ahab's feet. 
Then Gabriel shrieked out to his comrades to give way with their oars, and in that manner the mutinous boat rapidly shot away from the Pequod. As after this interlude, the seamen resumed their work upon the jacket of the whale, many strange things were hinted in reference to this wild affair. Chapter 72 The Monkey Rope in the tumultuous business of cutting in and attending to a whale, there is much running backwards and forwards among the crew. Now hands are wanted here, and then again hands are wanted there. There is no staying in any one place, for at one and the same time everything has to be done everywhere. It is much the same with him who endeavors the description of the scene. We must now retrace our way a little. It was mentioned that upon first breaking ground in the whale's back, the blubber hook was inserted into the original hole there cut by the spades of the mates. But how did so clumsy and weighty a mass as that same hook get fixed in that hole? It was inserted there by my particular friend Queequeg, whose duty it was as harpooner to descend. But in very many cases, circumstances require that the harpooner shall remain on the whale till the whole flensing or stripping operation is concluded. The whale, be it observed, lies almost entirely submerged, excepting the immediate parts operated upon. So down there, some ten feet below the level of the deck, the poor harpooner flounders about, half on the whale and half in the water, as the vast mass revolves like a treadmill beneath him. On the occasion in question, Queequeg figured in the Highland costume a shirt and socks, in which to my eyes at least, he appeared to uncommon advantage, and no one had a being the savage's bowsman, that is, the person who pulled the bow oar in his boat, the second one from forward, it was my cheerful duty to attend upon him while taking that hard scrabble scramble upon the deck. You have seen Italian organ boys holding a dancing ape by a long cord. Just so, from the ship's steep side, did I hold Queequeg down there in the sea by what is technically called in the fishery a monkey rope, attached to a strong strip of canvas belted round it was a humorously perilous business for both of us. For, before we proceed further, it must be said that the monkey rope was fast at both ends, fast to Queequeg's broad canvas belt, and fast to my narrow leather, so that for better or for worse, we too, for the time, were wedded. And should poor Queequeg sink to rise no more than both usage and honor demanded, that instead of cutting, so, then, an elongated Siam's ligature united us. Queequeg was my own inseparable twin brother, nor could I any way get rid of the dangerous liabilities which the hempen bond entailed. So strongly and metaphysically did I conceive of my situation then, that while earnestly watching his motions, I seemed distinctly to perceive that my own individuality was now merged in Therefore, I saw that here was a sort of interregnum in Providence, for its even-handed equity never could have so gross an injustice. And yet still further pondering, while I jerked him now and then from between the whale and ship, which would threaten to jam him still further pondering, I say, I saw that this situation of mine, if your banker breaks, you snap. If your apothecary by mistake sends you poison in your pills, you die. True, you may say that, by exceeding caution. You may possibly escape these and the multitudinous other evil chances of life. But handle Queequeg's monkey rope heedfully as I would. Sometimes he jerked it so that I came very near sliding overboard. Nor could I possibly forget that, do what I would, I only had the management of one end of it. The monkey rope is found in all whalers. But it was only in the Pequod that the monkey and his holder this improvement upon the original usage was introduced by no less a man than Stubb, in order to afford the imperiled harpooner the strongest possible guarantee for the faithfulness and vigilance of his m I have hinted that I would often jerk poor Queequeg from between the whale and the ship where he would occasionally fall, from the incessant rolling and swaying of both. But this was not the only jamming due party he was exposed to. Unappalled by the massacre made upon them during the night, the sharks now freshly and more keenly allured by the before-pent blood which began to flow from the carcass, the rabid creatures swarmed round it, and right in among those sharks was Queequeg, who often pushed them aside with his floundering feet. 
a thing altogether incredible were it not that attracted by such prey as a dead whale, the otherwise miscellaneously carnivorous shark will seldom touch a man. Nevertheless, it may well be believed that since they have such a ravenous finger in the pie, it is deemed but wise to look sharp to them. Accordingly, besides the monkey rope, with which I now and then jerked the poor fellow from too close a vicinity to the maw of what seemed a peculiarly ferocious shark, he was provided with still an suspended over the side in one of the stages. Tashtigo and Dagu continually flourished over his head a couple of keen whale spades, wherewith they slaughtered as many sharks as they could reach. This procedure of theirs, to be sure, was very disinterested and benevolent of them. They meant Queequeg's best happiness, I admit, but in their hasty zeal to befriend him, and from the circumstance that both he and the sharks were at times half hidden by the blood-muddled water, but poor Queequeg, I suppose, straining and gasping there with that great iron hook poor Queequeg, I suppose, only prayed to his yojo, and gave up his life into the hands of his god. Well, well, my dear comrade and twin brother, as I drew in, I then slacked off the rope to it. But courage, there is good cheer in store for you, Queequeg. For now, as with blue lips and bloodshot eyes the exhausted savage at last climbs up the chains and stands all dripping and involuntarily trembling over the side, the steward, yes, this must be ginger, peering into the as yet untested cup. Then, standing as if incredulous for a while, he calmly walked towards the astonished steward, slowly saying, Ginger, Ginger, and will you have the goodness to tell me, Mr. Doughboy, where lies the virtue of Ginger, Ginger? Is Ginger the sort of fuel you use, Doughboy, to kindle a fire in this shivering cannibal, Ginger? What the devil is Ginger? Will you look at that cannikin, sir? Smell of it, if you please. Then watching the mate's countenance, he added the steward, Mr. Starbuck, had the face to offer that calomel and jalap to Queequeg. There, this instant off the whale. Is the steward an apothecary, sir? And may I ask whether this is the sort of bitters by which he blows back the life into a half-drowned man? I trust not, said I hope I do no wrong, Mr. Starbuck. It is the captain's orders grog for the harpooner on a whale. Enough, replied Starbuck, only don't hit him again. But, oh, oh, I never hurt when I hit. What were you about saying, sir? Only this, go down with him, and get what thou wantest thyself. When Stubb reappeared, he came with a dark flask in one hand. The first contained strong spirits and was handed to Queequeg. The second was on charity's gift, and that was freely given to the waves. Chapter 73. Stub and Flask kill a right whale, and then have a talk over him. It must be borne in mind that all this time we have a sperm whale's prodigious head hanging to the peckwood's side. But we must let it continue hanging there a while till we can get a chance to attend to, to it. For the present other matters press, and the best we can do now for the head is to pray heaven the tackles may hold. Now, during the past night and forenoon, the peckwood had gradually drifted into a sea which, by its occasional patches of yellow brit, gave unusual tokens of the vicinity of right whales, and though all hands commonly disdained the capture of those inferior creatures, and though the peckwood was not commissioned to cruise for them at all, and though she had passed numbers of them near the crozets, nor was this long wanting. Tall spouts were seen to leeward, and two boats, stubs and flasks, were detached in pursuit. Pulling further and further away, they at last became almost invisible to the men at the masthead. But suddenly in the distance, they saw a great heap of tumultuous white water, and soon after news came from aloft that one or both the boats must be fenced. An interval passed and the boats were in plain sight, in the act of being dragged right towards the ship by the towing whale. So close did the monster come to the hull, that at first it seemed as if he meant it malice, but suddenly going down in a maelstrom, within three rods of the planks, he wholly cut, cut, 
was the cry from the ship to the boats, which for one instant seemed on the point of being brought with a deadly dash against the vessel's side. But having plenty of line yet in the tubs, and the whale not sounding very rapidly, they paid out abundance of rope, and at the same time pulled with all their might so as to get ahead of the ship. For a few minutes the struggle was intensely critical, for while they still slacked out the tightened line in one direction, and still plied their oars in another, the contending strain threatened to take but it was only a few feet advance they sought to gain, and they stuck to it till they did gain it, when instantly a swift tremor was felt running like lightning along the keel, as the strained line scraping beneath the ship. But the fag whale abated his speed, and blindly altering his course, went round the stern of the ship towing the two boats after him, so that they performed a complete circuit. Meantime, they hauled more and more upon their lines, till close flanking him on both sides, stub and sirt flask with lance for lance. And thus round and round the peck at last his spout grew thick, and with a frightful roll and vomit, he turned upon his back a corpse. While the two headsmen were engaged in making fast cords to his flukes, and in other ways getting the mass in readiness for towing, some conversation ensued between them. I wonder what the old man wants with this lump of foul lard, said Stubb, not without some disgust at the thought of having to do with so ignoble a leviathan. Wants with it, said Flask, coiling some spare line in the boat's bow. Did you never hear that the ship which but once has a sperm whale's head hoisted on her? But I sometimes think he'll charm the ship to no good at last. I don't half like that chap, Stubb. Did you ever notice how that tusk of his is a sort of carved into a snake's head? Stub. Sink him. I never look at him at all. But if ever I get a chance of a dark night, do you believe that cock and bull story about his having been stowed away on board ship? He's the devil, I say. The reason why you don't see his tail is because he tucks it up out of sight. He carries it coiled away in his pocket, I guess. Blast him, now that I think of it, he's always wanting oakum to stuff into the toes of his boots. Why, they say as how he went a-sauntering into the old flagship once, switching his tail about devilish easy and gentlemanlike, and inquiring if the old governor was at home. Well, he was at home, and asked the devil what he wanted. The devil! switching his hoofs up and says i want john what for says the old governor what business is that of yours says the devil getting mad i want to use him take him says the governor and by the lord flask if the devil didn't give john the asiatic but look sharp ain't you already there well then pull ahead and let's get the whale alongside i think i remember some such story I see you were tell but now tell me, Stubb, do you suppose that that devil you was speaking of just now was the same you say is now on board the Peckwood? Am I the same man that helped kill this whale? Flask, how old do you suppose Fidalo is, Stubb? Do you see that mainmast there pointing to the ship? Well, that's the figure one. Now take all the hoops, nor all the coopers in creation couldn't show hoops enough to make aughts enough. But see here, Stubb, I thought you a little boasted just now, that you meant to give Fidala a seat. Now, if he's so old as all those hoops of yours come to, and if he is going to live for ever, what good will it do to pitch him overboard? Tell me that. Give him a good damn the devil. Flask. So you suppose I'm afraid of the devil? Who's afraid of him? except the old governor who dare isn't catch him and put him in double darbies. But I am going now to keep a sharp look out on him. And if I see anything very suspicious going on, I'll just take him by the nape of his neck and say, look you, be all Didn't I tell you so? said Flask. Yes, you'll soon see this right whale's head hoisted up opposite that parmacet is in good time. Flask's as before, 
the pequid steeply leaned over towards the sperm whale's head now by the counterpoise of both heads she regained her even keel though sorely strained so when on one side you hoist in Locke's head you go over that way but now on the other side hoist in cants and you come back again but in very poor plight